I'm Roberta Lavin and your professor for this course. This week we are covering chapter 6, in, which is the last chapter in your first exam. It begins with a brief discussion of personality and how it is connected to social relationships. We will examine the foundations of psychological development and discuss some of the theories relevant to this age range. Let's begin with a little review from last week. Your family just had a new baby. When you are talking to the baby, you speak slowly and in a sing-song, high-pitched voice, and emphasize vowel sounds. In the context of vocabulary development, you are most likely engaging in? Do you know the answer? If you said child-directed speech, you are correct. What are some of the other words we use for child-directed speech? We also sometimes call it motheries or parentese. Let's try another one. Blank memory refers to remembering that occurs without effort or even conscious awareness, such as knowing how to tie your shoes. What fills in the blank? The answer is implicit. Let's move on to our objectives for this week. This week, we are going to discuss the development of emotions and personality in infancy, describe infant social relationships with caregivers, including attachment, discuss the emerging sense of self, autonomy, and moral development in toddlerhood, explain how social context influences early development, and explain child maltreatment and its effects. Psychosocial development from birth to 36 months can be characterized by some age groups. Let's review these real quickly. Zero to three months, infants show interest and curiosity. They are open to stimulation and they smile readily. From three to six months, infants can anticipate what will happen. They may become angry, wary, or disappointed. They may smile, coo, or laugh. There are reciprocal exchanges between the baby and the caregiver. From six to nine months, they play social games and elicit responses from people. They talk to other babies and they even like to touch other babies. They show fear, joy, and surprise. From nine to 12 months, infants become attached to their primary caregiver and may become afraid of strangers and new situations. They may have moods and they may experience ambivalence. From 12 to 18 months, Toddlers explore their environment using their attachment figures as a secure base. As they master the environment, they become confident and eager to assert their, their newfound freedoms. From 18 to 36 months, toddlers sometimes become anxious at longer separations from caregivers, and they engage in fantasy and play to identify with adults. Let's go over some of these in more detail. Emotional well-being during the early years has a powerful impact on social relationships. Children who are emotionally healthy are better able to establish and maintain positive relationships with adults as well as with their friends. Social and emotional development is essential to a child's sense of well-being. The first relationships help shape who they are going to become and their understanding of the world in which they live. The important people in children's lives help lay the foundation for a range of social emotional skills such as self-regulation, empathy, turn-taking and sharing, and positive relationships with adults and peers. Remember, personality is 
the relatively consistent blend of emotions, temperament, and thought, and behavior that makes each person unique. Psychosocial development is the intertwining of personal personality development with social relationships, and emotions are subjective reactions to experience that are associated with psychological and behavioral changes. Let's talk a little more about these. Babies share common patterns of development, but they also display distinct behavioral tendencies known as temperament. Eventually, temperament becomes personality, which is the relatively consistent blend of emotions, temperament, thought, and behavior that makes each person unique. Psychosocial development is the combination of personality and social relationships across the lifespan. I would recommend that you stop here and look at milestone number 40. Let's review. Emotions such as anger and joy are subjective reactions to experiences that are associated with psychological and behavioral changes. For example, fear is associated with changes in our heart rate. If you get scared, your heart rate goes up. The pattern of emotional reaction begins to develop in infancy. People differ in how often and how strongly they feel a particular emotion. And newborns clearly feel emotions, which emerge over development in a predictable sequence. Stop here and review milestone number 36, and then let's continue. Would you recognize the different cries in children? Crying is the earliest way infants communicate their needs. There are four unique patterns of crying to express hunger, anger, pain, and frustration. By five months old, babies have learned to monitor caregivers' expressions and if ignored, cry harder to get attention and then stop if the attempt is unsuccessful. A rapid and sensitive response to crying is associated with latter social confidence and positive adjustments. A hungry cry is rhythmic cry. An angry cry is a variation of a rhythmic cry in which excess air is forced through the vocal cords like one of those fire-breathing ministers on the pulpit. A pain cry is the sudden onset of loud crying, sometimes followed by holding the breath. It's the adult equivalent of profanity when you smash your finger. A frustration cry is typically two or three drawn out cries with no prolonged breath holding. By five months old, if you ignore a baby, they get louder and they do get your attention. As babies grow and learn, they also learn how to communicate and get what they want. We know the old wives tale that you will spoil a baby if you pick it up. But this isn't true. In fact, it's just the opposite. A quick and sensitive response to a crying infant results in better social competence. Take the time now to review milestone number 39. When you're finished, come back. Spontaneous smiling appears soon after birth, frequently appearing during REM sleep as a result of subcortical nervous system activity. Social smiling, when infants look at their parents, begins about the second month, signaling positive participation in the relationship with the parents. By 12 weeks, infants smile at others more or less frequently, depending on the response of the adults. Around three months, Babies try to join in fun by shrieking and making faces. Laughter becomes common about 4 to 12 months, 
and reflects cognitive development. By laughing at the unexpected, babies show they know what to expect. Anticipatory smiles are directed at the object, and then uh, their gaze shifts uh, to the adult. This occurs about 12 to 15 months. By six months, they giggle in response to unusual sounds and actions, such as putting a towel over their face, and by 10 months, they may laugh as they try to put the towel back on their face. Let's do a review question. Johnny, a toddler, plays happily with other children. Jill, another toddler, prefers to play alone. This, be this becomes what we think of as If you said personality, hey, you are correct. Um, Lewis proposed a model of emotional development that is depicted in figure 6.1 in your textbook. While babies have the rudimentary elements of emotion at birth, they are mostly physiological responses to sensory stimulation. During the first six months, the early emotions begin to differentiate into true emotions such as joy, surprise, and sadness, anger, and fear. Self-conscious emotions such as embarrassment, envy, and empathy develop only after children develop self-awareness or the cognitive understanding that they have an identity that is separate and different than others. By age three, they begin to be able to evaluate their own desires and behaviors and know what is socially appropriate. They can demonstrate self-evaluative emotions of pride, guilt, and shame. Remember, primary emotions emerge during the first six months. Self-conscious emotions develop in the second year. We learned that different emotions develop as the child grows in knowledge and becomes self-aware. Self-conscious emotions, which are emotions such as embarrassment, empathy, and envy, that depends on self-awareness. Self-awareness is the realization that one's existence and functioning are separate from those of other people and things. And self-evaluative emotions are emotions such as pride, shame, and guilt that depend on both self-awareness and knowledge of socially accepted standards of behavior. To repeat, self-conscious emotions such as embarrassment, empathy, and envy arise only after children develop self-awareness, the understanding they have an identity separate and, di and different from those of others. By about three, children have acquired knowledge about societal standards leading to self-evaluative emotions of pride, guilt, and shame that depend on both self-awareness and knowledge of socially accepted standards. Your textbook gives you some examples of early altruistic behavior. For example, the pen. A guest drops a pen on the floor and it rolls under a cabinet. The toddler it basically reaches under the cabinet and picks it up and gives it back. The other, the other common example is that when one baby cries, all the babies tend to start to cry, which, sadly for parents, is almost a given. Altruism seems to be natural to toddlers. The behavior they express reflects empathy, which is the ability to imagine how another person might feel in a particular situation. By 12 months, infants spontaneously help adults find things, and by 15 months, they have expectations of fairness. There is a belief that this may be partly due to uh, mirror neurons. 
that fire not only when a person does something, but also when he or she observes someone else doing the same thing. By mirroring the, by mirroring the motivations of others, they help a person to see the world from someone else's point of view. This seems to be extinguished by regular engagement on social media. Seriously, just joking. Um, the theory of mirror, mirror neurons is debatable as it lacks any direct empirical support. Toddlers seem to naturally engage in altruistic behavior by 12 months. So altruism is an activity intended to help another person with no expectation of reward. Sharing comfort and help may reflect empathy, the ability to see oneself in another person's place and feel what the other person feels. Brain cells called mirror neurons may underlie empathy, but this hypothesis lacks empirical support. Every baby is unique and has its own temperament, which is the style of approaching and reacting to situations. All babies are unique. Some babies are fussy, others are happy and placid. A child's temperament is his or her characteristic disposition or style of approaching and reacting to situations in predictable ways. I would be willing to bet that each of your mothers have made comments about your temperament and that of your brothers or sisters. Anyone want to say how your mom described the temperament of you or a sibling? Unlike emotions, which can change, temperament is relatively stable. It's related to a person's basic biological makeup and forms the core of the developing personality. The New York Longitudinal Study followed 133 infants into adulthood and identified three categories of temperament, easy children, difficult children, and slow to warm up children. Easy children are generally happy, have regular biological rhythms, and are open to experiences. Difficult children are generally irritable, have irregular biological rhythms, and have intense emotions. And slow to warm up children are generally mild but hesitant to accept new experiences. Patterns of temperament showed that 40% of children are easy children, generally happy in accepting new experiences. 10% are difficult, chil difficult children, more irritable and harder to please, with more intense emotions. And 15% of children are slow to warm up, mild but slow to adapt to new people and situations. Of course, not all children fit neatly into one of these categories. What we do know is that there is a strong link between infant temperament and childhood personality at age seven. While temperament is strong, strongly influenced by genetics, there is also a large influence by environmental factors. Now let's think about, about a question for discussion. Who wants a difficult child? Thomas and Chess's choice of these labels, easy, difficult, and slow to warm up, to describe temperamental differences in infants is heavily laden with connotations for parents. We will imagine having we all imagine having the Gerber baby because it looks happy and easy. Who, if they had a choice, would choose to have a difficult baby? It sounds as though there is something dreadfully wrong with a slow-to-warm-up baby. The labels less reactive, more reactive, and cautious have very different connotations. I would like to suggest that you get together with 
other students in your class and you discuss this issue. It's important to understand that if we are combining difficult and slow to warm up, that's 25% of all children. What are the advantages and disadvantages of being easy or difficult or slow to warm up? Which baby gets more attention? How do parents adjust? Which baby is more likely to be ignored? Is a baby with one temperament at greater risk for abuse? I would like to suggest that you stop here and you get your, together with some of your fellow classmates and you discuss these issues. And then you come back to the lecture. According to many researchers, the key to healthy adjustment is goodness of fit, which is the match between a child's temperament and environmental demands and constraints. Think whether you think parenting impacts who a baby will become. Do bad parents have bad outcomes? The evidence suggests good parenting, even with difficult children, may actually result in better outcomes because the child has been encouraged and learned to adjust. Everything didn't come easy to that child. We know that temperament has a biological basis and there is likely some genetic link. Behavioral inhibition has to do with how boldly or cautiously a child approaches unfamiliar objects and situations. When presented with a new stimuli, stimulus, inhibited babies become aroused, arch their backs, fuss and cry. Uninhibited babies are relaxed, calmly stare at the stimulus and show little distress. These patterns persist over time. Experience moderates and accentuates these early tendencies. About 20% of babies respond to novel stimuli by feeling aroused and find it unpleasant. 40% of babies have low behavior inhibitions and show little distress or motor activity to novel stimuli and often calmly stare at it and even smile. For some babies will grow up these babies, these that smile at the novel stimuli, these 40%, yeah, they're the ones that are going to grow up to be your ER nurses. The differences between babies is most likely due to brain development. Studies have shown differences in how, brain, how the brain reacts when stimulated. However, experience can moderate or accentuate early tendencies. For example, if a child is behaviorally inhibited, they are more likely to outgrow it if the parents don't shield them from new situations and instead provide support and encouragement. Cultural influence, uh, culturally influenced child rearing practices may influence temperament. The U.S. values individuality and assertiveness American babies are generally higher in activity, vocalization, frustration, and pleasure compared to babies from Italy and Norway. American babies are higher in positive affectivity and vocal reactivity than babies in Russia and Japan. Typically, babies reflect the values of their culture. I know this is provided as an online lecture, but I do suggest that you get together with friends and discuss the answers to the questions. After you've had time to discuss uh, this, come back and let's talk about some possible answers. Um, how do shy and bold children differ in styles of interaction with the environment? After you've thought about it or you've talked to a peer, pick up the phone and call them or go or go sit down and have this conversation, come back. Let me give you some suggested answers. Here are a couple of possible answers. Shy children are likely to withdraw from new situations. 
to observe new situations rather than to interact and to experience higher levels of physiological response such as increased heart rates. A shy child might wander off when shopping, um, might not wander off when shopping, um, would need a very consistent daycare center and would need plenty of time to adjust to changes in the home, daycare, or school. Bold children are likely to approach new situations, interact with strangers, and experience lower levels of physiological reaction to new situations. A bold child is more likely to wonder from the parent when shopping, could more easily adjust to changes, and would be at greater risk of having contact with strangers. Let's talk a little bit about the earliest social experiences which occur in the family. Infant care practices and patterns of interaction within the family vary greatly around the world. For example, in Bali, infants are believed to be the ancestor of gods brought to life in human form. They must be treated with dignity and respect. Among the Epi people of Central Africa, infants typically receive care from multiple caregivers and are routinely breastfed by other women. Um, in cultures where infant mortality is high, parents keep their infants close to them and respond quickly when they cry and feed them on demand. The father has a significant role, and I know sometimes we talk a lot about moms, but dads are also really important. In some societies, fathers are more involved in their young children's lives than in others. In the United States, fathers' involvement in caregiving has increased dramatically as more mothers work outside the home and concepts of fathering have changed. A father's frequent positive involvement with his child from infancy on is directly related to the child's well-being and development. Gender differences in infants and toddlers do exist. Gender refers to what it means to be male or female. It includes how people look, move, work, dress, and play. Girls are more likely to survive infancy and less reactive to stress. By three months, a preference for sex-type toys appears. And toddlers prefer to play with others of the same sex. This may be because as young as 17 months, uh, boys tend to play more aggressively and girls show better self-control and inhibition. Parents have a great influence on gender. Parents tend to use the same styles for boys and girls. However, U.S. parents tend to stereotype boys and girls. Fathers especially promote gender typing. The socialization process by which children at an early age learn appropriate gender roles. Fathers treat boys and girls more differently than mothers do, even during the first year. The highly physical play style of U.S. fathers is not typical of fathers in all cultures. And mothers may respond differently to highly physical play of boys than they do of girls. I'm sure you all have some examples from your own family and friends of ways that parents treated the genders differently. Let's talk about developing trust. Erickson argued that each stage in the lifespan we are faced with a challenge and complementary risk. Each stage has a specific developmental challenge. A baby's first challenge is forming a basic sense of trust versus mistrust. The critical element is sensitive, responsive, consistent caregiving, particularly in the feeding situation. 
Can the baby count on being fed when hungry? If successful, the de baby develops trust and hope. When unsuccessful, the baby uh, is mistrustful and has trouble forming quality relationships. Let's review Eric's stages from birth to three years. Infancy is birth to 18 months and the, and the ego development outcome of trust versus mistrust. Um, the drive and hope is what we hope for. Erickson also referred to infancy as an oral sensory stage. In early childhood, 18 months to three years, um, is a time of ego development. It is a time for autonomy versus shame. And the basic strengths here are self-control, courage, and will during this stage. And we learn to master skills for ourselves. At this point, uh, children begin to develop attachments. And an attachment is a reciprocal enduring tie between an infant and a caregiver with whom uh, it contributes to a quality of the relationship. Patterns of infant attachment are studied in laboratory technique called the strange situation. How many of you have a dog? When you come home, does it come to meet you? Probably. This is attachment. Now with children, this develops with usually the moms in infancy. There was a great experiment that was done with rhesus, rhesus monkeys that um, tried to assess their attachment. And the rhesus monkeys were put in cages with two surrogate moms. One of them was wire, wire mesh and provided food, and the other one was covered in terry cloth and didn't provide any food. The rhesus monkeys chose the warm, cuddly mom over the one that gave them food. The important point was that attachment to mom is not really related to food, but to the importance of providing comfort. There are four patterns of attachment that you need to know. Secure, avoidant, ambivalent, and disorganized. Secure attachment, you will see in the child's behavior that they are upset when the caregiver leaves and happy when the caregiver returns. In avoidant attachment, the child is unaffected when the caregiver leaves and deliberately turns away when the caregiver returns. In ambivalent, the child's behavior, the child hovers around the caregiver, angry when the caregiver returns, and in disorganized, it's kind of contradictory responses, and they're confused and afraid. Babies have attachment style, and good attachment with moms are important as it makes them feel safe. It isn't what the baby does when the caregiver leaves but what they do when it returns that is diagnostic. By one year old, babies have established a characteristic style of attachment. How attachment is established is also important. Attachment styles are the result of repeated interactions with the caregiver. Based on the re reliability of the caregiver's responses, Infants develop working models that become a blueprint for the dynamics of that relationship. The working model of attachment is related to Erickson's concept of basic trust. Secure attachments reflect trust. Insecure attachments reflect mistrust. Stranger anxiety and separation anxiety are a little different. Stranger anxiety is weariness of a person or place shown by some infants during the second half of the first year. 
Separation anxiety is distress when a familiar caregiver leaves. Babies rarely react negatively to strangers before they're six months old. Secure attachments in children tend to develop a good relationship with others, have longer, more varied vocabularies, are more curious, competent, and get along better with other children, and experience close, stable friendships in adolescence and healthy romantic relationships in adults. It's one of the reasons we say that it's really important to help children form secure attachments early in childhood. Emotional communications with caregivers is, can be described by mutual regu regulation in the process by which infants and caregivers communicate emotional states to each other and respond appropriately. Ideally, they experience interactional synchrony, which is unconscious coordination of behavior and effect between a caregiver and an infant. A lack of synchrony leads to distress. When interactions are synchronous, the baby is joyful and at least interested. Synchronicity is associated with higher IQ and self-regulation in later life. Social referencing is when babies check in with their caregivers upon encountering an ambiguous event. They are seeking emotional information to guide their behavior. As children get older, social referencing becomes less dependent on facial expression and more dependent on language. By five and a half months old, infants show evidence of social referencing but need both verbal and visual information. But by 12 months old, toddlers can use facial expressions or verbal tone alone. Now, one of the things you find in your book is these sections on research and action. And one of the sections in this chapter is on postpartum depression, which is really important because it impacts the entire family. Postpartum depression includes symptoms of major depressive disorders experienced within four weeks of giving birth that, infer, uh, that interfere with maternal functioning. Risk factors include prior depression, poor partner relationships, and financial worries. Untreated postpartum depression poses a threat to optimal child development. Experts advocate for mental health screening, education, and increased social support for new moms, and especially if there is a prior history of postpartum depression. Self-concept is a person's image of themselves, a descriptive and evaluative mental picture of abilities and traits. And by three months of age, infants pay attention to their mirror image. Infants also prefer images that look like their own face. The, this is kind of the adult equivalent of a selfie. Self-awareness, which is the knowledge of the self as a distinct being, emerges between about 18 and 24 months. And by 20 to 24 months, toddlers begin to use first-person pronouns. Children also start to seek their own autonomy or their own independence. Erickson argued that between 18 months and three years, children enter a second developmental challenge, autonomy versus shame and doubt. While seeking independence, Un unlimited freedom isn't safe or healthy, thus shame and doubt do have a necessary place. 
This period marks a shift from external control to self-control, such as child controlling his or her own temper. A typical example of this is toilet training, which allow the toddler to feel control over his or her body. We then move in to the terrible twos. The terrible twos are not universal. In, in a cultural study, American mothers regarded toddlers as capable of misbehavior and punishment. Um, while others, uh, while most Guatemalan mothers did not. American parents believe responsible behavior develops through competition and negotiation. And Mayan parents believe responsibility develops when children are old enough to understand the need to respect others' desires and their own. So culture does play a role in, uh, in how two-year-olds develop. And no specific behavior is universal. Let's talk a little bit about moral development. Socialization involves the development of habits, skills, values, and motives shared by responsible members of a society. Internalization of these standards involves accepting external society standards as one's own standards. At around two years old, children show self-regulation, independent control of behavior to conform to what society expects of them. In other words, they are starting to develop the origins of a conscience. One goal of parenting is the development of a child's conscience, which involves the ability to refrain from certain acts and feel emotional discomfort when standards are violated. Situational compliance is the obedience only in the presence of an external authority figure. Uh, According to Kachaska, children who have internalized their parents' requests show committed compliance, which is obedience of a parent's orders without direct uh, reminders. That is committed compliance. Going a step further, receptive cooperation is a child's eager willingness to cooperate harmoni harmoniously with parents. But it's not just the parents who influence, but also the peers. Sibling conflict is a vehicle for understanding social relationships. Constructive conflict promotes the development of empathy. Lessons and skills learned from interactions with siblings carry over to relationships outside the home. And peer influences are also important. Peers are non-siblings. Infants and toddlers show interest in people outside the home, particularly people their own size. During the first few months, they look, smile, and coo at other babies. Babies become attached to their other siblings. This includes rivalry and affection, pro-social and play-oriented behaviors it's more common than is the rivalry. So toddlers learn by imitating one another, and they do this through games like follow the leader, leading to frequent verbal communication. Cooperative activity develops during the second and the third year. And, and some of the conflicts help children to learn to negotiate and resolve disputes. One of the other things that you need to think about and is common now but wasn't always is maternal employment. When I was a child in the 60s, it was unusual that my mom worked outside the home. Now it's the norm. Labor force participation by mothers has increased dramatically since the 1970s. Longitudinal data showed negative effects of cognitive development when U.S. moms worked in the child's first year of life. Positive factors like maternal sensitivity, a high-quality home environment, and high-quality child care lessen some of these 
negative effects. We do have early childhood care and we always are in hopes that it will become more readily available to people. Factors that impact child care include structural characteristics like staff training and child to staff ratios and process characteristics like warmth and sensitivity of workers, as well as the appropriateness of activities. About 60% of children under six not enrolled in kindergarten are in some form of childcare. About 40% of those children are cared for in some organized facility. Your textbook in table 6.2 gives you a checklist of how to choose a good facility. And of course, the top of that list is, is the program licensed. And are parents welcome to visit unannounced at any time? I would highly suggest that you read through the list of what makes a good child care facility. There are some effects that we know from early child care. It is difficult to, outside, to isolate, though, what are the effects of the child care from the other influences in the child's life. Long days in child care are associated with stress and a small increase in externalizing behaviors for three and four year olds. However, good quality child care centers are associated with greater language comprehension cognition, and readiness for school. Maltreatment is abuse and neglect. So uh, maltreatment can take several forms, physical abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, and emotional maltreatment. Physical abuse is injury to the body through punching, beating, kicking, or burning. Neglect is the failure to meet a child's basic needs, such as food, clothing, medical care, protection, and supervision. Sexual abuse is any sexual activity involving a child and an older person. Emotional maltreatment is rejection, terrorization, isolation, exploitation, degradation, ridicule, or failure to provide emotional support, love, and affection. State and local child protection services received an estimated 3.5 million referrals for alleged maltreatment of 6.2 million children in 2017, a 10% increase from 2013. Babies who do not receive nurturance and are neglected sometimes suffer from non-organic failure to thrive, which is a slow or arrested physical growth accompanied by poor developmental and emotional functioning. Poverty is the same single greatest risk, risk factor. Shaken baby syndrome is a form of maltreatment in which shaking an infant or toddler can cause brain damage, paralysis, or death. Head trauma is the leading cause of death in child abuse cases in the United States. You can take a look at, um, at this graph or this chart and you can see the incidence. The highest rate of maltreatment is for age three and younger. Babies that do not receive proper affection and nurturance can suffer from non-organic failure to thrive. And then, of course, phys uh, shaken baby syndrome, which we just dis dis discussed in children under two years of age. Some of the risk factors for maltreatment include marital problems of the parents, stressful events like getting laid off, lack of parental education, poverty, substance abuse, and depression. 
geographical and economic factors do increase influence the rate of abuse. Child abuse is rare in countries like Japan and Tahiti, where violent crime is rare, and children are rarely spanked. In the United States, nearly half of parents of school-age children still report using physical punishment at home. I want to thank you for paying attention to this lecture. If you have any questions, you can join me for office hours or email me your questions. Thank you.